Hi, thanks for joining us today on our uh, video interview with Mike Watkins from Udo Media. Thanks, Mike, for joining us. It's a real pleasure to interview you. I met you last year uh, at a networks event which uh, you spoke about uh, Facebook. So I'd put you in the Facebook specialist category, is that right? Yeah, I'd say so. Okay. So Mike, tell me a little bit about yourself and Mudo Media. So it's a rather interesting tale, so uh, just tell our uh, viewers uh, what led you to start Mudo that? Media. Well, I guess about me, firstly, um, I'm really interested in people and how people interact with one another and how they consume information and how that process has sort of evolved over the last five years. Yep. So how Mudo started was... When I was 18, I left high school. Right, okay. Um, didn't know what I wanted to do. Yep. I wanted to go to uni and spend 20K on a degree I didn't know I was going to use, basically. So I went travelling for about about six months to a year when I was about 19. Mm -hmm. Went to the States, Europe, everywhere like that. And during that time, I met a lot of solo travellers. Yep. I was a solo traveller myself, so I was linking up with solo travellers along the way. And whilst I was doing that, I thought I'd go online and try and find a website that did something similar. So I linked up solo travellers based on where they were from and where they were going. Turned out there wasn't one. Um, so I went back home, wrote a business plan on the plane going back, built a website for around 10 grand called findatraveller.com. This was in 2005, early 2005. Is that still running? No. Okay. It was actually brought out two years after I launched it. Right. Um, and what that did was linked up solo travellers around the world based on where you were going um, and what times. Right. So that was my first sort of foray into, I guess, social media, um, before even social media was a word. Um, after I'd sold it, I sold it privately to a travel holdings company who essentially um, took the database and repurposed it into their own product. Right. So finding travel, the brand from that point didn't exist, from that point on. Um, I lived in Christchurch, so after I sold that, I moved to Sydney mm -hmm. and built another website called Gunnago, built a business plan around it. Sorry, um, and actually got an investor on board for about 150 grand. Wow, okay. It's about two years ago. Yep. Um, and started developing that. During that time, I met a lot of people in the travel space who were interested in what we were doing with the Gonna Go, the website, the yep. travel website, the second generation one. And I got a lot of offers to come in and do consulting on social media um, through those avenues. And from there, I actually ended up starting to build a business out of consulting through that, so right. did work for one person, they told someone else, and social was just getting on people's radar at that time, so... What year was that? That would have been probably 2008, so Mudo started off on a napkin probably early 2008, mid-2008, yep. with one client on a three-month contract, and that was just helping them with the Facebook strategy. I think Facebook only would have had 30 or 40 million people at that time? Yeah. Only 30 or 40 million? Only 30 or 40 million. But, um... Even from that time, I saw the value of Facebook and how powerful it was going to be. Right. I was 100% behind the idea that these guys were on the right track, they had the right people leading it, and they had the right thinking in behind the platform and how it was built. What made you realise how powerful Facebook was? What uh, Just the process of not, you know, it's built purely around people as a sort of social utility. It's not a place to go and... Um, like MySpace was, it's not a destination for entertainment content mm -hmm. um, or bands specifically, things like that. Facebook was always built around people and allowing them to sort of share and interact with one another in a way more effective way than was previously possible. Right. And that's what Zuckerberg has always said, like, you know, it's a social utility to help people um, connect and share mm -hmm. things with one another. And I think having that founding principle or vision is what has made it what it is today, yeah. over 600 million people. Yeah. What impressed me when I actually joined in, it was 2008, yeah. uh, was the ability when I logged in registered the first time to connect to people I hadn't seen in 20, yeah. 25 years from yeah. when I did my teaching degree. Yeah. It just pulled them up onto the screen. I went, wow. And that's exactly why it's so powerful, yeah. just for that experience. Like, you would have had an emotional connection then oh, yeah. to several people you haven't seen in so long. Um, and that's really been the only platform to successfully nail, um, I guess, that approach yeah. online. 
it's so it's almost become an ecosystem in its own right. So um, well, I must I prefer, yeah, I I'm hundred percent behind the idea of Facebook now is it's sort of it's definitely matured into a mass medium in itself and I keep coming back to that sort of train of thought when right. talking to clients and stuff. Right. It's, okay. Question is what what's been your biggest challenge with Muto Media and uh, consulting and doing strategy? It's selling value. Right. Um, I know how valuable it is, and I know how valuable the platform is in terms of being able to push marketing messages to um, consumers. Um, like pages is one way of doing it, but I think the overall idea of Facebook being that consumers have to opt in to receive messages from brands, that's huge. Mm -hmm. So we're now not you know, creating messages in a broadcast type medium like radio or TV or newspaper, we're, we're hoping people will see it, like we're hoping people that are interested in our brand or our, our service will see it and then act on it. So it minimises the spam? Totally. And yeah. it, minimal, it, it improves the quality of your audience, like... It's opt-in, is that what yeah, you mean? Yeah. yeah. So on Facebook you might have you know, a community of 150,000 people around your brand, or say 40,000 people around your brand through a page. All of those people will want to hear from you. All of those people want to be associated with you. That's what they're doing when they're liking your brand, they're endorsing your product or your service. Yeah. Um, so any message you send out to them, provided you do it properly, is likely to be received yeah. more effectively than other mass media in the past. So when you're saying the biggest challenge you face is actually selling the value of Facebook, is one of those obstacles selling that value is that is seen as a play thing, as uh, yeah. something mean, that's sort of... Uh, it's not a proper business tool. That's the fascinating thing about us guess, being involved with Facebook marketing for about three years now and evolving with the platform in terms of um, marketing and how we sold it. Initially, when we started, it was seen as a play thing. It's just another social platform. What about MySpace? You know, Facebook's killed MySpace. Now, what's going to come and kill Facebook? That's been the catch cry for about a year and a, you know, over the past three years, maybe the past two and a half years, that's what yep. everyone's going against. But... Now we're seeing a bigger push, I guess, in a positive way. Um, mm -hmm. Especially over the last six months, people are really starting to understand and realise that Facebook isn't just a play thing. It's going to be here for a long time. And it's actually woven itself so deeply into society now, and especially in the Western world. Um, yeah, they're actually starting to see the value of what it can offer. Yeah. Brands. So it's getting easier to sell that way. But I think a lot of... The biggest problem is, and everyone who's worked in social or tried to sell it into a client will know what I mean when... It's easy to sell it into sort of middle managers and people who work at the coalface and understand the business and what it's got to do. They see the value on Facebook. That's why you're there. But in order for them to be able to get, you know, the whole strategy approved, they've got to sell it into someone higher up in the business. Yeah. Is, yeah. So is that a generational thing? Or is it just... It's no too easy. It's too easy to throw it into age. No, okay. I don't think so. Okay. Um, I think people who do the job day to day and, and within, say, business A, um, sort of see what other brands are doing in the space yep. and see how effective it is and they always want to try new things. Um, but it's the C level that always sort of ends up knocking it down because they're either A, too scared of doing it because they don't know enough about it or B, they don't see, you know, they see more value in things like TV and um, newspapers. and Because that's what they're comfortable with? Totally. Yeah. You know, um, so in terms of challenges uh, the job is I guess a social media agency that's twofold when you're trying to sell ideas it's first trying to sell the idea which is hard enough in itself so sell a strategy and sell the benefit and all that sort of thing and the second half of it has always been it's a teaching exercise you've got to mould those two together so sell the strategy but also teach people and how this whole ecosystem works and where the value is in social, especially Facebook, um, to allow them to understand and um, sort of realise the benefits in the strategy you're selling. Does that make sense? Yes. So that's the hardest thing in terms of, I guess, challenges yep. that the space okay. um, brings up. But that's why I like doing it, because it's awesome. Yeah. I like being in the new space. Well, you're obviously passionate about it. So, okay. That's some of the challenges for, uh, I suppose, getting the idea across of what value does it bring to an organisation, to a company, and a brand. What's been your biggest win? 
Um, I can see anyone who knows me well or knows Muto would know it's, it's got to be Supre. Um, Tell we, us about Supre. Well, Supre's got 140 stores across Australia and New Zealand. They're a twin yeah. Yeah. retailer, like everyone knows. Yeah. But what we did was... Um, and Supre, what, what, so they're a retailer. What to business are they in? Uh, tween, like the tween market. So in fashion? Yeah, yeah. sorry. Yep. So teen girls fashion age maybe 13 to 24. Yep. Um, and what we did was we consulted to them probably late, well, sort of mid-2008. Um, and I rang the brand manager and said, what are you doing on Facebook? And she said, oh, nothing. We've just invested a lot of money in MySpace. So I was like, it's interesting. Why did you do that? Um, so I ended up talking to her for about half an hour and we ended up having a meeting later that week and I sold the idea of Facebook on her so we started off with ads first for products back into the pray.com.au which did really well um, and then pages came out about a month and a half later as mm -hmm. a product and what we did is just built a page um, and I sort of had an idea of how I wanted to create content and push content through the page as well. Yep. So we ended up writing sort of content rosters and developing strategy around how we would create content collaboratively, collaboratively between Supre and sort of Muto, mm -hmm. um, and then how we would feed that through the page itself. And what we ended up doing was one post, we started doing one post a day on Supre, this was nearly 18 months ago, and we've done one post ever since that time. Mm -hmm. And the fortunate thing about being early onto the platform when no one else was, we were probably be one of the first proper pages to take full advantage of the platform when it first came out. Right. So you've been with the Facebook pages almost from the beginning? Two, yeah, it's about two weeks in. Two weeks in, right. Yeah. Okay. And the good thing about that is there's no one else on the platform, so you've got free reign sort of to do what you want. And you've got the biggest share of voice, so more people hear about you and your brand's more visible and more people join you. Okay, question on how did you get momentum on the Facebook page initially? It's, when... When that came around, the platform was really, it's a lot more viral. There's a lot more viral drivers in it than there is now. Right. So if you did post a, a piece of content and people commented on it, or the like wasn't around at that time, but they commented on it, um, that just, that piece of content did, you could just see it going through other people's news feeds and you know, the comments, it's friends' news feeds and stuff like that. Because we just started picking up really heavy, heavy viral growth, maybe about a month in. Did you do any seeding with the Facebook banner ads, display ads at all? We did about two months in. Right, okay. And that was just, again, when um, inline fanning ads came out. I was actually on Facebook at the time, and I was looking at TechCrunch, and they said Facebook has released this new set of ads called inline fanning ads. And what they were... Inline fanning? Yeah, so what they were were the ads, you know, you'd have your normal ad, title, image, copy, and underneath that it would have the become a fan button. Right, okay. Remember those? No, but okay. Uh, similar to what you've got today, right? So okay. you've basically got the ad unit and there's a call to action in the ad unit. Like today, we've got the like yes. at the bottom. If you click that, you automatically become connected to that page. Right, okay. Same sort of thing. We jumped on that with about, I don't know, maybe a hundred bucks. Through that, through a hundred bucks at those ads, held a real low CPC, like the highest CPC um, we set it at was about 40 cents. And over the past, over the following sort of, I don't know, two months, we ended up picking up maybe 30 or 40,000 people um, on roughly $5,000 worth of ad spend. Wow, okay. So, so it was very effective back then. Yeah, mm. just because no one else was there. So that sort of built a base for us. Yeah. Um, but we continually kept pushing good content and we focused on what was engaging people and what wasn't. So social media is still about good content, isn't it? Of course it, it is, yeah. Yeah. Totally, and if anyone thinks otherwise, it's... Yeah. So, any media, it doesn't matter whether it's social or not, no, yeah. it's still got to be good content. No one cares about brands. They care about, now they care about what brands you know, stand for and yep. how they're replicating what they stand for into content. Yep. That's what people connect with and engage with. Yep. And that's what then amplifies messages. And yeah, so it's driven from great content, unique yeah. content. Yeah. So okay. that's, that's what we did with Supre, and we just kept doing really cool things like we did a um, at the moment we're running an It's Best With Friends campaign which basically what what fans do is go and um, 
take an image, like an image of themselves with their friends, and we sort of verify that image and give it a stamp. And what those fans can do is take that image into Supreme and get a discount, like a real world discount. Yep. So we're trying to really focus on um, how online engagement through social under brands can drive offline sales. Right, and, di and discounts and vouchers and specials are quite important. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, you need carrots still to incentivize people to. Yeah. Like any marketing, yeah. Yeah. And that's about it. I mean, last week we hit a massive milestone. We crossed 300,000 people. Wow, okay. So 300,000 people for one brand, which is sort of specifically focused in a narrow ish market, is really, really, really cool. Yeah. I guess the coolest thing, the biggest win about that is being able to test out things. Um, yeah. Test out thinking strategy on a mass market in yeah. a way. I've noticed that on the Super A page you actually can get fans to select one of two different fashion items and say which one do you prefer. So instantly you're doing like research on the fly. Correct. Yeah. In real time. Yeah. yeah. And we actually do use that. Um, we've built it into Supre's sort of business model in a way. Um, so. Those items that we put up aren't necessarily available at the time. They're yeah. in production, um, and you know, designers are mocking them up and working with them, and they're about to go into production. So, what doing this market research sort of update posts allow us to do is find out which ones, which one the market likes the most, versus which one they don't, and that then feeds into how much, how many units Supre makes of each item. So right. obviously, the one they like. Fans like more will be produced more. Yep. The one they like less will have less produced. And yep. that's sort of having a marketed impact over a sort of overall sales, but also um, sort of wastage, I guess, on overstocks. Like yep. Overstock of um, items. So, yeah, I mean, you touched on a really good point. Facebook is, we've developed a whole lot of ways to really engineer updates to produce the most amount of engagement possible. Right. I think that's really important and not enough people focus on that. Yep. There's a real science and art behind it. And a lot of people might think that's a whole lot of bull, yep. but it's actually true. And I think the overall focus for anyone who wants to be serious on Facebook has to be about maximizing engagement because that's what feeds messages out. Um, and then that's what amplifies brand awareness and everything else with the platform. From people sharing, mm. okay. Through deep engagement. Okay, where do you see Facebook going in the future? I know that so we've had a chat in the past about uh, Facebook and um, F commerce is yep. one term that's been starting to be bandied about recently. Yep. Where do you see Facebook going in the future? The major trends and uh, and basically you know F commerce or um, stores online within Facebook itself. So the first question, where is Facebook going yes. in the next yeah. five years? Yeah. Um, like I said earlier, Facebook's a mass medium now in my mind, so it's, it's just reached a point, you know, 600 million people, it's sort of taken over the Western world in a way. Yeah. Um, and fundamentally what it's done is taken the real world, especially in a Western sense, and put all those people, all those connections, all the information about those people, and put it online into a digital I think it's as simple as that. Right. It's massive. So the future is going to be, I think, you know, smart brands and um, businesses are going to realise that and sort of view Facebook as the sort of underlying social layer for the entire internet, not just a website. People who still view Facebook as a website, you know, as a tap onto a, a marketing strategy or something like that are yep. missing out. And I think the next wave of how people use the platform is going to be um, building, say, microsites and stuff like that that have a brand's own branding. They can build their own sort of environment on the internet um, and their own sort of you know, functionality and experience. But instead of getting people to sign up through a manual sign-up process to that community, and the, like they've had to do in the past, you know, like names, first name, surname, email address, data birth, all that sort of stuff, to actually get into it as a user... People are just going to tap on, you know, this Facebook Connect functionality, so they sign in with Facebook. Then all of a sudden, that person's within that microsite. You know, they're obviously themselves, so there's authenticity there now. Um, and the amount of information 
applications or you know, these microsites have the potential to get around people, around you and me, like they know who my friends are if they want, they can know what I'm interested in, they can access my photos, they can find out so much deep, sort of rich information about me, mm -hmm. that if they do it, if they build an app like a platform properly or a microsite properly, they can turn the experience from a generic one, which it has been in the past, so yep. you go there, nothing really changes when you go there, yep. it's not about you, it's about the brand and you interacting with the brand in a way that's quite static. Um, I think it will change to a completely personalised experience. So Serving up personal information yeah. that is targeted and delivers what people want. Yeah, yep. I mean, so I go there and I think, well, this has been sort of built around me. It's, you know, I'm getting information that I'm interested in, not stuff that I'm, you know, I'm vaguely interested in, if that makes sense. Um, and I think personalising that experience is going to be a massive theme. Right. Um, in the future, and that's only been possible now. Like everyone talks about personalising experience, and they have done for years, but it's only personal now on a mass level because Facebook's gotten so big, and um, they've just got so much information about consumers. Right. Um, it's only realistically now um, possible. So yeah, personalised experience is the key, and Facebook's got a major role in that because it's got the information we need to yep. make things personalised. Right. So that's where you see it going in the future. Okay, just quickly, um, just winding up, last question, which was I asked before but we didn't quite cover, was uh, online stores within Facebook, where do you see that going? Within Facebook? Yes. So I'd dodge away from that straight away. Right. I think smart, you know, we're, we're dealing with stuff, doing stuff with Supreme at the moment along that area. Yeah. And um, I think companies will leverage off the information Facebook has got about their consumers yep. through, say, a page or something like that, yep. and actually build a third-party microsite or an e-commerce platform right. that combines, A, the products yep. that they obviously have to sell, um, but also include in it a social layer of, like, say, who I am, um, what sort of things I'm interested in, and then potentially serve clothing from their catalogue or, or their lines that tie into things that I'm interested in or um, yeah that I've indicated I'd like to receive more of. So making the online store much more personal. Yeah. Yep. Um, okay. And so that's the first part making it personal and the second part is including friends in the shopping experience so making it extremely social. So yep. again it involves Facebook because you, you have to sign in through your Facebook profile as you. Yep. But uh, if the online platform you know, is allowed to or is able to pull in my friends to my buying experience, whether it be by me throwing up a question and saying, what does everyone think about this? Um, and that content, that question going to, say, five friends who I trust, who I would nominate through the platform mm -hmm. to share my, you know, shopping um, experience with. Yep. I think that's sort of the way I see stuff going. So it's very powerful from a word of mouth point of view from friends, basically. Yeah, yep. but I think it's more so about how that consumer actually shops online. It's no longer a static experience. It's an experience where it's personalised. They're getting stuff that, right. they, that they are actually interested in. Okay. Um, and they're able to include friends within that shopping experience as well. Yep. Like a really, lastly, a really good example would be, which are going to try this out, is bucketing consumers together. So for a fashion brand, for example, we we could put, you know, have five different types of body types, for yep. example, um, and bucket those consumers together who use the platform and then track what those types of consumers was a specific body type actually buy. Um, because from the research we've done with Supreme, a lot of other fashion brands, we know that certain size people buy similar clothes right. based on what yeah. their fits are and what they feel comfortable wearing and all that sort of stuff. Okay. So being able to aggregate that information around, like say, if body type A, we know 40,000 of them have bought a mixture of these types of clothes. We can sort of then package that information and send it in an email wow. to those people and say, hey, this is what other people your body type are wearing in your country, um, have a look through it. We're not going to try and sell it to you. We're just offering you um, sort of a trend alert notice, I guess. So it's almost like a smart uh, 
web, specialised, totally personalised web that yeah. delivers up what you want, when you want it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Just quickly, um, what would you say to a business that is thinking about using Facebook as a marketing platform? What would be, what would you, in a couple of sentences, what would you say to them? Um, the first one is what do you want to use it for? Is it to sell product or is it to get brand awareness? Right. It'll tell me straight away. And use it in different ways depending yeah. on that, yes? So the goal, yes? Yeah, the second okay. thing would be they'd need to really define who their target market is because the only way to build a, build a community on Facebook, people will probably disagree with this, but it's my personal opinion that the only way to build a community on Facebook now is through ads, effectively. Um, and in order to do make effective ads, you need to have a really good understanding of who you're targeting. Right. Um, so that's the second thing I'd do. Um, the third thing I'd do is focus on content. So what we do with clients is build them a content roster of a month and yeah. say this is what we think you should be pushing every single day or every second day. Um, so get them sort of thinking in the mindset of what content they want to push to people. Um, and the third thing would be sort of measuring, I guess, success. See. And so some analytics behind that as well. Yeah, proving what works and what doesn't. Yeah. You need to focus on that. So the four things you said there were, know what the goal is of the marketing you're going to do, be doing. Yeah. Number two is who are you going to be speaking to, your target Maybe markets. Consumer, yeah. Creating great, unique content. Yeah. Okay, so, and the last one was uh, measuring it. Yeah. yeah. So they're, they're the four things you would say, these are things you should be considering if you're going to be doing Facebook marketing. Yeah, and like the overriding one is you have to be willing to put budget forward to actually... So make a commitment. Yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah. don't throw, you know, if you're a $40 million company, don't throw a thousand bucks at the um, office junior and say, create me a Facebook page. Right. Because you're going to fail and you're going to get a bad sort of, insight into how social works when if you yeah. do it properly and you know, throw maybe $100,000 at it, yeah. do it properly for three months, measure the results, you know, you'll start seeing really how the space can, can work for your brand. So some strategy, commitment, which yeah. is budget, and then just do it. Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks, Mike. It's been a pleasure to have you uh, appear today on our video, and um, we look forward to uh, seeing you again. Awesome. Okay. So thank you viewers for uh, tuning in today and uh, we look forward to seeing you in our next video. Thanks Jeff.